Welcome to Drive the DAF. Clear, structured explanation of the daily DAF in 20 minutes. You can even follow in the car. Has one Mishnah about halfway through the DAF, but it's really only one subject, both before and after the Mishnah. The whole DAF is primarily discussing the topic of Basis Lidovar Ha'asr. This is a Mukta subject. It's referring to a situation where we have a Mukta object in or on a non Mukta object. So the Allah is that if it is in a place where it belongs, the Mukta object belongs on top of that object, then the bottom object is a support for it, it serves it, and it becomes mukta just as well. If, however, there are both mukta and non-mukta objects that belong there, then it becomes a support for both of them. And it's, whether it's mukta or not follows, which is the more important of the two objects. There is a situation in which you have mukta object mixed in together or in a very significant, important non-mukta object, and then the mukta object, instead of making the Non, the mukta object becomes not a problem. You're allowed to even move it around. And that's what we're going to be starting the daf with. We had in the mission that we just saw two cases in which you have mukta being moved around, and you're allowed to move it around because it is in a more important non mukta motor object. So the first case we saw in the Mishnah on the daf yesterday, the beginning of the parak was that of a stone in a basket filled with fruit. You can move it around. You're allowed to carry around the basket, even though there's a stone in there that's mukta. Because it's not significant. And the second case was if you have a mixture of truma timeo, which is useless, you can't do anything with it, on Shabbos at least, and therefore it's mukta. But if it's in a basket with truma tahira, or a chul and regular food that you could eat, so you don't have to worry about it. The Mishnah, the Gemara, primarily focuses on these cases. Then it goes to the third case in the Mishnah. It works through them one by one, trying to figure out what exactly the case is and who the author of the Mishnah is. Then we get to the next Mishnah, which also discusses the Allah of Abbasis. That's where you have a stone on top of a barrel. When you're allowed to move the stone, when you're allowed to knock off the stone, when you're allowed to move the barrel. And that'll take us to the end of the death. Now, the primary thing to understand over here is as follows. You don't want to be moving mukta. You want to avoid moving mukta, even if you're not picking it up and carrying it with your hands. You do not want to be in a situation where you're moving mukta. So it's problematic. Whenever we say you're allowed to move the basket with the stone in it or something like that, why are you allowed to carry around the mukta stone? Why don't you just knock it out? If you can knock it out of the the basket, it'll, be, it'll solve the problem. And that's what the Gemara leads off with over here. We're starting a few lines into the daf at the two dots. The Gemara says, why are you allowed to carry around the basket with the stone in it? Just drop it out. Knock it out. Shake it out. So Gemara says, well, what do you mean? How am I supposed to? Gemara says, what do you mean? It's simple. Just dump out all the fruit in the basket on the floor. The stone will fall out. Then pick up the fruit, that it's good fruit, and put it back in the basket. What, what excuse do you have to walk around with the stone? So Gemara says, so like we're going to see later, um, it's Rabbi Eloi, the name of Rav, explains, but we're talking about soft cooked fruit. If you dump it out on the floor, it'll get ruined. So Mara says, you should still be able to shake out the stone. Shake it, rock it around until you can get the stone to knock out. So Mara gives a different answer. Mara says it's referring to where the stone actually fell into a crack, a hole in the basket. It's plugging the basket and becoming part of the basket. It's not mukta anymore. It becomes part of the basket itself. Okay, the Gemara now goes to the next case in the Mishnah, which is very similar. It's where you have truma tohira and truma tamea together in the basket. And Rav says, we're talking about, you let it carry around the basket with the truma tamea in it, it's referring to where the truma tahira is on the bottom, underneath the truma tamea. That way you can't get it out. If, however, the truma tahira is on top, so then the, take it out with your hands, carry it with hands. You don't have an excuse to carry around the basket with the truma tamea in it. So Gemara says, what do you mean? Even if you, the truma tahira is on the bottom, why don't you just pour out all the fruit and then pick up the truma tahira and uh, carry that? So Gemara says, the same answer, it's uh, soft fruit, cooked fruit, it'll get destroyed if it falls on the floor. So when I says I have a brysa explicitly against the statement of Rav Chizda, the brysa says that it doesn't matter which one's on top, quotes the same case and says even if the Shum Patahir is on, is on the top, he's still allowed to carry around the basket. You don't have to pick out the Shum Patahir. So Rav Chizda says it's not a problem with me. It's two different situations. One is where you want to get the fruit and one is where you need to get the basket out of the way. If the basket's in your way, you need the place where the basket is, you're allowed to pick up the basket. Um, so our Mishnah that said that uh, that I said was referring to where the truma tamea had to be on top, otherwise you should be able to just pick up the fruit. That's talking about where you need the fruit. So you can't get to the fruit, so you're allowed to pick up the basket, and that's only if the truma tamea is on the top, so you can't get to the fruit. 
the brisa that you brought me that says you're allowed to just pick up the basket even if the truma tire is on top, that's where you need to get the basket out of the way. Even if you took the truma tire off the top, it won't help you. You still have the basket in the way. You're allowed to pick it up and move it. So the Gemara says, I don't understand you, Rav Chizda. You're telling me that the case in our Mishnah is talking about where you're trying to get to the fruit. And then you have to change. You have to say, it's only talking about where the fruit's on the bottom because the fruit will be on top. You'll be able to just pick out the fruit and leave the basket. What are you telling me these two things for? Just make it simple. Say that we're referring to we need to get the basket out of the way and then it can be talking about all cases. Chumas on top, chumas on bottom, tar, tome. What, what do you have to say? No, we're talking about specifically where you want a fruit and then it has to be that it's on the bottom. So Gemara says no because Rebbe looked at the next Mishnah which we're about to see further on the daf, which is really the Sefer. It's the end of the same Mishnah and that clearly is talking about a case where you want the fruit or similar to you wanting the fruit. What's the case there? The case is we have money on a pillow, and the mission says you're allowed to just knock off the money and use the pillow. That has to be where you need to use the pillow. Because if you wanted to use the place that the pillow is on, you needed to get the pillow out of the way. You wouldn't need to knock the money off. You could just pick up the pillow and carry it away. So since that case is obviously where you need to use the pillow, so here it has to be where you need to use the fruit. It's not just where you need the place and you need to get it out of the way. Okay, now the next halacha which we saw in the Mishnah is the only part of this stuff which is not specifically muktzah related. The Mishnah said if you have a mixture of truma to me of of uh, truma in your chulin, so the halacha is that truma is bottle of a false nechulin in the amount of one to hundred. You need a hundred times as much chulin as truma. However, even if you have that amount in this bottle, you still have to take out a amount of fruits equal to the truma that fell in. So, for example, if you have 100 apples and one truma apple falls in, you got to take out an apple, set it aside, and that goes to the kayin. And the Mishnah said that you're allowed to do that on Shabbos. Ah, what do you mean? But if you don't do that, you can't eat any of the apples. You have to take out an apple. Again, it might not necessarily be the truma apple, but you have to... The truma is bottle, so you don't have to worry about that. But you do have to set aside an apple to replace the truma apple that fell in. So the Gemara says, if you don't do that, you can't eat any of the fruits, right? So now you're telling me that if I take out that one apple, on Ch- I'm allowed to take it out on a Shabbos. But what do you mean? I'm fixing all the apples. Now I can eat them. It should be, it should be like metaking. It should be like fixing something that you aren't allowed to use. That's, a, that's tikkun money. That's forbidden on Shabbos. Why are you allowed to do this? So the Gemara says, obviously, this is, of, of, this is uh, in accordance with the opinion that says that we view whatever fruit comes out as the truma fruit, even though it might not necessarily be, but halakhically we, we make this into the truma fruit. And therefore the truma is never really mixed in. We don't view as if the truma is mixed in. There's 101 fruits here, 100 of them are permitted. Any one that I take out is going to be the forbidden one. So it's not mixed. I just have to take it out. But the, the other 100 are mutter. So therefore, when I take it out, I'm not actually fixing anything. I just now I know which one I shouldn't eat. But uh, it was never like it was forbidden in the first place. So now the Gemara wants to know, where do you see such an opinion? Where do you see somebody who holds that the fruit, the truma fruit, is always considered to be set aside? It's always, it's not mixed in. The other ones are considered to be separate, and it's mutter all along. Where do you see? And the Gemara is going to try three different tanoim, which we will say, hold of such an opinion. The Gemara's first attempt is that this is the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer, who argues on the Chachamim in the following case. Let's say you have five turuma apples that fall into 50 chulun apples. Now the ratio is 1 to 10, and therefore you don't have any bitl. But now let's say 10 of these apples go and fall into another basket of apples. What's the share of bitl that you need? So according to Rabbi Eliezer, we assume that the five apples that fell in fell out. We assume all the apples that fell in that were truma, all the apples then fell out. So you got five truma apples falling into the next basket. You need to have 500 apples against it. According to the Chachamim, no, you look at the ratio. We don't know which apples fell in. So the ratio in the apples w- was 1 to 10 is truma. So you assume of the 10 apples that fell out, one of them was truma. You only need 100 times 1. So the Gemara says, you see, Rabbi Eliezer holds that the apples that came out are all the truma apples. So you see, he holds that the, the, that those truma apples are on the side. They're not considered mixed in. As soon as they come out, we know that those are the ones. And this is Rabbi Higgins' sheet to hear. So the Gemara says that, that that doesn't prove it. That Rabbi Eliezer said, L'chumra. He said, you have to assume all, the, you have to be machmer, you have to be worried that all those truma apples came out and fell into the next basket. How do you know? He would say, Lakula. He would say, like we're saying in the Mishnah here, that you don't have to worry um, that you're allowed to take the apples out on Shabbos because it's considered to be separate already. How do you know he would say that? Not necessarily. So the Gemara tries this next attempt, and the Gemara says, no, it's really the opinion of Rabbi Shimon. In this case, is as follows. Let's say you have a hundred uh, chulun apples and one truma apple falls in. 
So it's a bottle. It's one in a hundred. It's a hundred times as much. But before you get a chance to take it out, or to take any apple, I guess you don't know which one it is, another apple falls in. Oh, now you have two in a hundred. Now it's not bottle anymore. So what do you do now? So Rabbi Shimon says it's bottle anyway. The Tanakama says, no, now you need twice as much. It's not bottle. So the Gemara says, you see Rabbi Shimon's opinion is that it's bottle anyway. Obviously Rabbi Shimon holds it's not cold mixed. That apple's on the side. I was about to take it out. I was about to take out an apple to set it aside. So I could still take out that apple, and I could take out this apple. Both of them are bottle because they're considered to be standing separate from the other apples. I was about to take one out, and I'm about to take this out, so it's considered to be standing separate. Versus not necessarily, you don't know that that's what this machoikis is about. Maybe Rosh Shimon just holds its bottle. Since it's bottle, it becomes chulin. Like we learn, whenever something falls in and it's bottle, it changes. So that chuma apple that fell in became chulin. Now, okay, true, I have to take one out to replace it, but it became chulin. So when the next apple fell in, it was, that's falling into a share of bittel. It's 101 against one now. According to the Chachamim, no, they combine. The bittel only changes the apple that fell in into chulin when you actually find out and you do something. But if two fell in, one after the other, you don't say that the first one's bottle, and then that works to make the next one also bottle. Okay, this is a concept that Halacha called mishapech. The apple that falls in his bottle becomes switched over. It changes over to be like what was mevatel it. So the Gemara tries the third attempt. The Gemara says, now it's the opinion of Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar. Shimon ben Elazar says, if you have um, a truma apple falls into a hundred, so you don't have to take it out. You just have to eye any apple with your eye and say, you mentally decide that's going to be the one I'm going to take out. Then you can eat all the other ones. You just have to leave that one over for the end. You don't have to actually pick it up. So that obviously he's holding that once that, that it's on the side and it's not mixed in, everything else is okay. So our Rabbi Huda holds the same way. Our Mishnah here holds the same way. I keep my true map on the side and I don't have to worry about it. So the Gemara says, what do you mean? But Rabbi Huda, but, but this Mishnah doesn't agree. This Mishnah is Rabbi Huda. It doesn't agree with better Rabbi Shimon Ben Elazar. Because Rabbi Shimon Ben Elazar says you have to actually look, you, you just have to look at it and decide. Our Mishnah says you, you have to take it out. On Shabbos, you're allowed to, but you have to take it out. So the Gemara says, yeah, you can't say, so he holds like Yishmin but he's even stronger. If Shimon Malazar says it's not considered mixed, if you look at it. I review this, it's not considered mixed, Pachal. It's not considered mixed at all. Even if you don't look at it, you ha- you should take it out, because you could take it out on Shabbos. It's not a problem. It's even better. If Shimon Malazar says, you have to put your eyes on it, and if you have, it's considered to be separate, but you have to set it aside mentally. You have to fix the mixture. Amish says you don't have to do it. It's considered to be separate, but you may as well do it because you're allowed to do it on Shabbos. Not a problem. Okay, this takes us to the next Mishnah. Uh, Mishnah has two cases with two halachas each. The first one is where you have a stone on top of a barrel of wine. So the stone is muktzah. Gemara is understanding. We had a machlokas how you understand this, but this Gemara is understanding that the stone is just, it's not the cover of the barrel. It's just sitting there. It's muktzah. You like to get it off, so you don't, pick it up and take it off because it's muksa. What you should do is you should just knock, you should lean the barrel, tilt the barrel till the stone falls off, and then you can take the barrel and do what you want with it. The says, but if it's tightly squeezed between other barrels, you're afraid when the stone falls it's going to break a barrel, so you have to pick it up, pick up the whole barrel, carry it, carry it out of the storehouse, and then knock it off over there. But you do not pick up the stone and take the stone off under any circumstances. Okay, next is if you have money on a pillow. So again, it says you should shake the pillow until the money falls. Now, if you have um, some type of disgusting matter from a bird on the pillow, so you're allowed to wipe it off with a rag. Now, uh, wiping with a rag is not called laundering because there's no water involved. Um, but if it's a leather pillow, so then you're even allowed to use water because putting water on leather is not called laundering. You shouldn't actually put it in the laundry, but you're allowed to just wipe it off with water. Okay, so first of all, the Gemara says about... Moving the stone off the barrel by shaking it off, it's got to be that you just forgot the stone there, it was just left there, but it's not where it belongs. If it's a place where it belongs, then the entire barrel becomes mukta. Bustles it over us. Okay, now the Gemara says, here's an interesting thing over here. We're telling you that you should do more work in order to avoid moving the mukta stone. In order to avoid having to touch the mukta stone, you have to pick up the whole barrel. It's a lot of tircha. You have to schlep it around. Who's the one that holds? We'd rather you do extra work than touch something which is mukta. Prefer that you do tircha. Uh, strenuous activity over mukta. So the Gemara says this is Rosh Hashem Amliyo who explains a Mishnah discussing with Chogas Beis Yama Beis Shammai and Beis Hillel about picking beans on Yom Tov. What's the story there? You're allowed to do Bayer to some extent on Yom Tov. Question is when you're trying to pick out, separate beans from psolas, beans from 
trash, should you take the good from the bad or bad from the good? So Beishami says you should always take the good from the bad. Don't take the bad from the good. Basil says, no, you're allowed to take the bad from the good. So comes over Shem Gam Leo, and he says, Basil only said that where the good is less than the bad. So by taking the bad from the good, where the good is more than the bad. So by taking the bad from the good, you're doing less work. If, however, taking the bad from the good is more work, so then you shouldn't, you, he would not say you should do more work and take the bad from the good. You could, you should take the good from the bad and do less work. So where he says, you see, it's the same thing. He says, don't touch the psoilus, don't touch the bad stuff, to avoid more work. The Gemara asks, what do you mean? It's backwards. What Rav Shemim was saying is that Beis Hillel says you're allowed to touch the bad stuff. That's when it's less work. But he wouldn't say you should touch the bad stuff if it's more work. In our case, you, we're saying you should be avoiding... We're saying you should avoid touching the bad stuff, the rock, no matter what. Even if it's more work. We're telling you to do more work. Rav Shemim Ben Gamliel was changing Beis Hillel's opinion to say that it's more important to avoid doing extra work. But in our Mishnah, we're saying you could do extra work, just as long as you don't have to touch the rack. Do whatever you want. Slap the barrel around, as long as you have to do extra work. We don't want you doing Tir Khan Shabbos or Nyantif. So the Gemara says, no, it, really the case is where it's not extra work, because you're going to need to get to the bottom of the barrel anyway, and the only way to do that is to pick it up and tilt it over on the side. Okay, so now you're slapping it full instead of empty. It's not that much extra work, not that big a deal. Okay, fine. The Gemara goes further. The Gemara says... That um, we have a brisa. Rav Yaisi says, if the barrel was in a uh, storehouse or it was next to glass kalim, so then you should carry the barrel out. You should lift it up, carry it away, and knock off the stone over there. Very similar to what we saw in our brisa over here, and agreeing uh, brisa. Okay, now the Gemara goes further to the case of the money on the pillow. And Rav Barashi says the name of Rav, again, it has to be that you forgot the money there, it's not where it belongs, because otherwise the pillow would be muksi, so you wouldn't be allowed to move it under any circumstances. And now we have the Rabbi of Khan, the name of Yechon, which is quoted earlier, that says that this is only if you need to use the pillow. If you just need to get the pillow out of the way, you move the pillow with the money on it. There is no need to knock it off first. Okay, the Gemara now shifts gears to a different form of moving a muksa, and that is the heter of kikor oitinok, which is if you have a muksa object, sometimes we allow you, under extenuating circumstances, to move it by placing a loaf of bread or a child on it. You want to move the loaf of bread on the child, so we say you can pick up the muksa object that the loaf of bread of the child is on and move it that way. That is not a general heter. That doesn't usually work. It's a special leniency which we allowed you to do in cases of extreme need. And we said put the child or the loaf of bread on it so that it doesn't appear like it's regular carrying a muktzah without a heter. But again, it's not a real heter. The real heter is that there's extreme need. So the question is, in what cases do these apply? So Rav Ashi says if you forgot your wallet in the street, you're allowed to do that. Rashi says that you avoid carrying by walking less than four hours uh, at a time. The Gemara says it's in a chutzer, though, so it's not clear why Rashi needs that. Um, Rav Yisuk says it's okay to use that header if you left a brick out. Uh, Rav Yisuk Bar Shila named Ravasi said Rav Yisuk Bar Shila said Ravasi once uh, he quoted that they once forgot a bag of money in the Rosh Hashanah and they asked Rav Yechonah what to do and he said use the loaf of bread or the child. So here we, there we have three examples. Marzucha says that the halacha is like all of these, but it's only if you forgot it there. If you left it there on purpose, then you can't use this uh, excuse. Ravashi says none of these things work. All these cases don't work. The only case we're allowed to use the heter of the child or the loaf of bread is if there's a mace. It's a person who died and the body is left out in the sun and he's going to uh, begin to decay. You're allowed to bring him into a cold place uh, by putting a loaf of bread or a child on him. Okay, now the Gemara has a story here. The Gemara says that Abaye wanted to move a uh, heap of cotton uh, or of straw, and he put a spoon on it to be able to move it, a similar kind of heter, and Rava wanted to move a uh, yaina, a bird which was slaughtered, so it's raw meat, and he put a knife on it. So Moses said, Rav Yesa said, oh, look at these kids, they have a very sharp sugi over here, they think that if you put a spoon or a knife, a very sharp idea, you're allowed to just move it. But that's not true. The halacha was not said that you can purposely move something like that. It's only if you forgot. It's only if it's you're in a situation where you're stuck. So the says Abaya and Rav defended themselves. Abaya said, if it wasn't the fact that I'm a chashiv person that people look up to and they can learn wrong halachas by watching what I'm doing, then I would just move the, the heap of cotton 
or hey myself because it's not mukta it's useful on Shabbos you could lean on it I'm adding an extra chumrah because people watch me and learn halacha from me and Rava said the same thing applies to raw meat raw meat is not mukta raw meat can be eaten some people eat raw meat on uh, in any circumstance therefore it's not really mukta and I'm allowed to move it I added the knife just for extra chumrah because people watch me because I'm another mukhasha so now the Gemara says hold on a second Rava holds that if raw meat, if you couldn't eat raw meat, it would be mukta. Why? It's animal food. Um, it started off Shabbos as animal food. Any bird can be eaten by an animal. So you mean to tell me that we had that Rava holds like uh, that you can't change from animal food to person food on Shabbos? If you did that, it would be called mukta. But I have a proof that Rava holds like a Shimon, who doesn't hold of all this mukta stuff. Because uh, he told his uh, servant to take the stomach of a goose and feed it to a cat. Now, the stomach of a goose and feed it to a cat, um, that's, that's it, when it, when it used to be human food when it was part of the goose. And now when it became, when you took it out of the goose and it's now it's useless, so now you throw it to the cat. So according to Rabbi Yehuda, that should be mukta, but he didn't have a problem with doing that. Obviously, he holds like a shimin. Umar says, no, no, no. He really holds like a behuda. Over there, it's not a problem because the stomach is always disgusting. You never think of the stomach as being human food, even when it's in the goose. Um, so that it didn't change function. But really, it does hold like a behuda, and I'll prove it to you. Because Rava once gave a speech, and he said the following, Allah so a woman should not go to the wood house to take a branch of wood to use for something because it's set aside for firewood, which is uh, yantif, and e- which is mukta. And even on yantif, when you're allowed to use firewood, you should not burn broken kalim because they are not set to be firewood and they change function on Yantif and therefore it's Mukta. That's Rabbi Huda who holds that way and obviously therefore Rabbi does indeed hold Rabbi Huda and if the meat wouldn't be edible raw it would be Mukta. Drive the Daf is a project of the Grand Woodland School and is presented by Rabbi Yitzchak Landa. Find us on YouTube or subscribe to daily emails by emailing drivethedaf at gmail.com.